Okay, so now we're on to the afterword. The problem of couple relationships is not new. However, recent times have given it particular relevance. The fact is that the past has relatively rarely encountered the question of the compatibility of couples since a couple's family was a rarity until recently. In the old days, usually several generations lived under one roof with all their many branches, and this could not but affect the atmosphere of relations. Large families, uh, family artels and workshops, close peasant and urban communities, all this allowed a person to spend his entire life in the circle of numerous loved ones and find among them individuals with such an order of functions that would compensate for all the shortcomings of marriage. It's different now. The urbanization of society and the greater economic independence of individuals increasingly leaves spouses facing each other, and not, at all, and not all of them pass such a test. How can one not recall the brilliantly lapidary lines from Vladimir Vys Vysotsky's song, Here you get so busy in a day, when you come home, you're sitting there. Uh... The book, The Syntax of Love, is designed to eliminate this kind of situation from life, or at worst, to alleviate the situation. A character in one of Oscar Wilde's famous novels asks the question, will psychology, through our efforts, ever be able to become an absolutely exact science, revealing the smallest impulses, every hidden feature of our inner, of our inner life? And it seems to me that it is psychosophy that is capable of giving a positive answer to this question asked a long time ago. Without exhausting the entire vast palette of mental reactions, it is capable of predicting the system of human values and the behavior of an individual, as well as identifying those aspects of his psyche that he carefully hides not only from others, but also from himself. Perhaps reading syntax will give cause for concern that some spouses, having discovered in hindsight all the imperfections of their marriage, will urgently break the usual ties and having determined the personal order of functions, the rush to search for a partner, with a crosshairs on processional and effective. I don't agree. I think this will not happen, and divorce in connection with the book will not become a general phenomenon. <laughs> uh, fear of the unknown, the habit of living together, the commonality of children and property are a sufficient guarantee of the strength of most families today. Moreover, introducing the syntax of love to not so lucky spouses, I'm sure will, on the contrary, significantly strengthen their marriage since mutual understanding is the main source of family troubles. If spouses have an idea of the order of function of functions of their partners, and with it um, an idea of the strengths and weaknesses of their natures, an idea of what should be expected from them and what should not be expected, their life together will become incomparably easier and more comfortable. Therefore, the book is addressed not only to the future, but also to the present. And its goal is not, not only forecasting, but also correction of pair relationships. Although I would like, of course, to hope that over time the need for correction will disappear, and love in its entirety will become the only form of relationship between people. Well, that's nice. The fears of those who suspect in uh, syntax of love, the destroyer of amorous romance, the, de the desecrator of the purest well, free from rational filth, the drainer of love, will also be in vain. Not at all. According to my observations, psychosophy turns out to be a uh, absolutely ineffective when it encounters endocrine love, i.e. a love that lives only by REA hormones, when mutual attraction is determined solely by the vigorous work of the endocrine apparatus, right for passion, and no properties of the object of love influence the choice, except for the fact that it was the first to catch one's eye at the moment of an uncontrolled hormonal, sur hormonal surge. In this case, psychosophy, even for those initiated into it, completely loses its power. In addition, I can say that for myself that my passion for psychosophy, which is exciting at first, does not become a way of life. Trying on mental typology for yourself, family colleagues, cartoon characters is interesting, funny, useful, but like everything else in this world, of course. Having played enough with psychosophy, a person calmly sends it to the subconscious, where knowledge lies that is not in daily demand. He is therefore can light up, get excited, glow, be jealous, and even be mistaken regarding his, regarding his subject. It's another matter that when following the looks, gestures, smiles, omissions, and other similar pleasures of the initial stage of an amorous relationship, circumstances begin to demand deeds, actions, responsible behavior, 
Psychostomy emerges from the depths of the psych subconscious as a lifeline and puts everything in its place. Reasonably, um, reasonably observe, approving or disapproving of the choice. It helps a lot, I know from myself. Once already bursting with the heat of love, psychoscopy literally pulled me by the hair from the edge of the abyss. And now, several years later, observing my former love and knowing about her subsequent adventures, I cannot convey how glad I am that this cup has passed from me. So yeah, psychoscopy, yeah, it's it's not going to be like a constant, you can't use it as like a constant thing with every relationship uh, from the get-go, but maybe once the passions wane a little bit and you become more reasonable, you can use it to kind of save yourself from a bad love situation. In general, the remarkable property of psychosophy is that without feeding or feeding, without feeding on illusions, it does not dilute itself at its own expense in the sense of its effectiveness. Being addressed primarily to the logical function of a person, it knows about the diversity of intellectual reactions and does not expect popular recognition. Another important observation regarding psychosophy is that having left the subconscious and returned to it, it still returns not to its original place, but somewhere on the line between intuition and knowledge. I deduce from the, this from the fact that anyone who has mastered psychosophy has mental vision immeasurably sharper. He does not become a robot constantly busy sticking psychological labels. And I'm guessing it continues like sticking psychological, psychotypical labels on people. Like any system that objectifies perception, psychosophy does not make the world beautiful. Science is science. It is not honey or a hot water bottle. Uh, not sure what a hot water bottle means in this context. Um, but psychosophy allows you to look around without disappointment because the best way not to be disappointed in people is not to delude yourself about them. In a word, with the syntax of love, our bleak life becomes easier, simpler, more honest, more fearless. I think that's it. Thanks for that. Okay. So I'm just going to continue on and read this interesting section here, um, which seems, I mean, maybe it isn't, but it seems like kind of a holdover from the Soviet days um, where you'd kind of have to like, you know, justify your literature with Soviet propaganda. Um, but maybe it's just Afanasiev's quirkiness coming through, because I think this was written after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, application, inevitability, Russian supreme power in the light of psychosophy. Uh, it is difficult to speak at any length about the monarchical period of Russian history in the context of psychosophy. Uh, tar Tartuffe in a skirt, a weak and crafty ruler, not a king on the throne, an actor. This is how Russian poets characterize the autocrats of that time, and thereby confirm the diagnosis, which suggests itself even with a cursory glance at the family tree of the Russian czars. The third will reigned supreme among our monarchs. However, judging by the fact that in the 18th century, the Russian aristocracy, repeatedly faced with the choice, with rare consistency, chose Philistines as their kings, the secret of such stability lay not only in the defective gene pool of the Romanov family. On the contrary, it was heredity, uh, heredity playing with genes that interrupted the sometimes evil infinity of the royal gene, gene, yeah, genealogy and placed people with a high-ranking will on the Russian throne. Uh, Paul I and Alexander II. But let us pay attention. Both of them ended, ended their lives as martyrs and their violent death quite transparently hinted at the sincere commitment of society to the kings with the third will, who corrected the shortcomings of the hereditary monarchy through regicide. It is not for nothing that in the 19th century they like to say that Russia is an absolute monarchy, humbled by regicide. In any case, the murder of Paul I was determined by purely psychological motives, and people with a fine mental organization foresaw it long before it became a fate, fate accompli. Frederick the Great wrote prophetically about Paul. He seemed proud, arrogant, and harsh, harsh, which caused those da 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 translation cuts off. Uh, there was a reason for the preference of the Russian society he gave to the third will. The instability of her will saved society from sudden movements while maintaining hopes for change. The stability of the House of Romanov 
was well explained by one of her English biographers in explaining the stability of the throne of Queen Elizabeth of England. He wrote, it was not only her mind that provided her with an invaluable service. Character also helped. In him, in this combination of masculinity and femininity, power and sinuousness, persistence and inconstancy, there was exactly what her calling required. Some deepest instinct always kept her from making firm decisions. If she suddenly took a decisive step, she immediately vehemently disowned it, after which she even more violently disowned her renunciation. Such was her nature. To sail where there was no wind on choppy waters and frantically turn from tack to tack when the wind came. If she were different, if she had, as befits a strong leader, the ability to choose a line of behavior and relentlessly adhere to it, she would have been in trouble. Okay. Uh, the same picture is in the history of the Philistine Romanov dynasty. Although the Philistine is a deaf tyrant by definition, he is at the same time sensitive to those invisible fluids that permeate society and never goes into open confrontation with it. The main thing that constitutes the true strength of the Philistine ruler lies in his weakness, weakness of will, timidity, and decisiveness. Therefore, it is not surprising that despite unsuccessful wars, famine, tyranny, and executions, the predominantly Philistine Romanov dynasty existed in Russia without serious upheavals, upheavals for three centuries. Right, so it's like, <clears throat> yeah, because of their weakness and their indecisiveness, um, you know, it's they don't make a strong, they don't go in a strong direction that then causes conflict with parts of society. Instead, they kind of create like an uneasy, indecisive, compromising uh, truce with the political factions of the society. Much more interesting from the point of view of psychosophy is the situation in the country after the October Revolution. The seizure of power by the communists led to the fact that the monarchy in Russia was replaced by a monarchy, but not a hereditary one, but to put it clumsily, a narrowly elected one. Such a system was, one cannot say, completely unprecedented. In its principles, it stood very close to the system of the papacy. The only difference, perhaps, was that the Politburo of the CPS, CPSU Central Committee, which decided the fate of the supreme power already in Soviet Russia, was ten times smaller in number than the Vatican Conclave, but the rest is all the same. Kind of an interesting comparison. If you ask me what is the special attractiveness of the system of communist enthronement for psychosophy, you can answer it briefly in the purity of the experiment. In this case, the gene pool did not influence the choice in any way, did not muddy the waters, and in its natural form, the psychotypical aspect of the choice came to the surface. The psychology of power reve revealed itself most clearly. After all, a certain psychotypical mechanism had to operate here, elevating the, an individual to the top of the social pyramid or overthrowing him from there, forming a politburo, deciding the fate of the supreme power, and it's interesting to trace these patterns now. Uh, there is no doubt that after the overthrow of the monarchy, Lenin or... <laughs> okay, I just... The, sometimes the translation does this weird like little repeating thing, um, but... Uh, there is no doubt that after the overthrow of the monarchy, Lenin would eventually end up at the head of Russia. Um, and I, okay, I guess there what he, he's kind of trying to do with that repetition is he's saying Lenin would eventually head, um, would eventually end up at the head of Russia. So he's, he's making this like kind of double point where it's like, there's no doubt historically that after the overthrow of the monarchy, of course, Vladimir Lenin would en eventually end up at the head of Russia. But he's also saying at the same time, there's no doubt in such a situation as this that a Lenin, a VLFE, would eventually end up at the head of Russia. Okay. The beauty and stupidity of the majority of politicians of that time, especially intolerant during the period of war and revolution, almost automatically cleared the place for the most ambitious, thoughtful, and cynical politician. Lenin is ambitious, first will, intellectually strong and relaxed, second logic, sensitive to the needs of the people, third physics, and these meaning, I guess, their material needs. And these components of the psychotype provided Lenin with the most favored nation status when seizing and maintaining power in Russia. And I guess for, for the emotion, he can shut off and be indifferent to um, 
you know, <laughs> emotion or higher feelings, um, sympathy maybe. Naturally, after the creation of the Communist Party, and especially after the October Revolution, the environment determined by a psychotype from which Lenin's successor was destined to emerge was intensively formed around Lenin. Although Lenin himself rarely asked questions of this kind and moreover never pointed at anyone personally, his psychotypical symp sympathies th themselves narrowed the circle of possible candidates. So he's talking about Stalin here. Previously in the section devoted to the first will, it was already said that the king has very poor relations with the owners of high-ranking wills. Uh, he is not afraid of them, respects them, but cannot get along. Uh, so one of these, you know, are, are not afraid of each other. They respect each other, but they still have trouble getting along because they fight for power. Such people are too independent and are nothing more than fellow travelers where not fellow travelers are needed, but a retinue, uh, maybe some four V's. The czar feels that the owners of high ranking will are not his people. And widely using their services, he tries not to let them close to him into the highest echelons of power. The king is not too fond of the fourth will. I, I mean, I don't know about that. Um, to me, I just I disagree with that so far due to my um, knowledge of attitudinal psyche and its take on things. But anyway, the king is not too fond of the fourth will. He values the, the serf's humility, diligence, and sincere loyalty. However, the fourth will gives the king a lot of reasons for irritation. She is not searching. Her performance is soldier-like, straightforward, not sensitive, not artistic, and most importantly, the fourth will has little initiative and tends to burden the ruler's life with many small issues that she could easily resolve herself. Hence Lenin's specific attitude towards the serfs, uh, Bukharin, Kamenev, uh, Lunacharsky, Molotov, Kalinin, etc., of whom he formed, as it were, the second distant circle of his retinue, the second echelon of power. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. The king usually gives all his sympathies to the third will. That's strange to me. Although the first will probably feels that it is not her who is loved, but her place... Uh, and the Philistine not only will not bat an eyelid when looking at the former ruler lying in the dust, but will certainly kick him. <laughs> Still, the Tsar is too self-confident to seriously think about his fall, and the many specific advantages of the Philistine, as it were, redeem him in, in advance only by an intuitively perceived betrayal. Um, the main advantages of the Philistine, he is in love with a strong will, in love with power and sincerely strives in their field, strives to be useful to them. He is searching, flexible, efficient, artistic in the execution of tasks. And although sometimes he argues and bucks, the king even finds it a pleasure to pacify his rebellion so that the next day he can hear the sound of the Philistine's bald head on the floor, sobs of bitter repentance, seeing downcast eyes and shaking hands. It was from such people, Trotsky, uh, Zinoviev, Stalin, that Lenin formed his first closest circle from which his successor was later to emerge. That's interesting. Um, and I wonder if he would apply that to, you know, the, the nature of all first functions towards their respective third functions. Um, and this being, you know, an example of Eros um, in some way, um, just on the political stage. <clears throat> At the same time, it cannot be said that the selection work carried out by Lenin in his circle eluded the eyes of not only his contemporaries, but also his comrades. Prominent party members, Osinsky Lutovinov, wrote to Lenin that he surrounded himself with reliable and obedient but dishonest people, helpless people with a flexible spine, but they heard at nothing but abuse from Lenin in response. Thus, the clear preference given by the king to the third will determines a certain kind of continuity of power and determines the face of the immediate political history of the century, including the coming death of the state system laid down by the first will. Just as the first will of Napoleon elected the flexible but little, but of little initiative Marshal Grouchy as the pursuer of Boucher, uh, and thereby, or Boucher, I don't know, um, 
and thereby doomed Napoleon to defeat at Waterloo and the death of the empire, so the first will of Lenin, making him the successor of the Philistine, caused a slow but consistent extinction of the founded uh, of the communist empire founded by them. <sighs> do, do, do. True, shortly before his death, Lenin seemed to come to his senses, and due to the innate harmfulness of his character, he smeared his closest associates with mud in the will. Um, so I don't know if will there means, you know, his will, like his informal, his, you know, desires for what should happen after his death, or if he means with mud in their willpower, in respect to their willpower. I'm not sure. However, the effect of this uh, demarche or demarche um, is not arbitrary. Um, demarche, maybe? Um, demarche. Uh, the contenders for the throne simply hid the will of their beloved leader and teacher from the people. Although, in all honesty, there is no great need for this, the belated Philippics of the will could not wrest the levers of power from the hands of those whom Lenin himself assigned to them. Oh boy, this section is pretty long. Let me see, uh, let me see real quick. Well, I guess I can't check. Oh, we'll just trudge forward. Um, or, you know what, let me skip ahead quick and see how much longer we got. Oh boy. Oh boy. Well, Three more pages, I guess. It's kind of interesting. Actually, I prefer this section over the last one. According to Rozanov's evil but apt remark, the Dobchinskys sought off Tolstoy on his last journey. And so they buried Lenin. In 1924, Lenin died, and the long pending question of his successor came to a head. There were three contenders, Trotsky, Stalin, uh, Zinoviev. Um, schematically, the battle of these three Dobchinskys can be represented as follows. Of course, I can't read that, but I know that Stalin was an FLVE, or that's how he types him. From the present diagram, it is clear that all three were too similar to each other for the battle between them to be sufficiently fleeting. All three are cruel, a combination of first physics and third will. Okay. Uh, ambitious, unprincipled, but not very decisive third will. Thus, with the identity of the first and third functions and the shutdown of the fourth and crisis situations, the fate of the Russian throne should have been decided by the second functions, or more precisely, the difference between them. Uh, if the trio had fought for the position of chief director in some theater, Stalin's cause could have been considered lost in advance, but since in this case we are talking about the highest political post, here, on the contrary, Stalin's victory was ensured by nature itself. While Trotsky and Zinoviev, having turned off the fourth logic, in anticipation of the fight against the passion inherent in the second emotion, rehearsed speeches, selected biting words, tried on facial expressions and intonations, Stalin... Um, Stalin thought. He used his second logic. He managed to think through everything. Who to kill, what reshuffles should be made among the nomenclatura um, in order to reduce the share of enemies in it and increase the share of supporters. How to set up the hall during meetings that decided personnel, personnel issues so that opponents were not allowed to speak. And as a person who takes the thinking process and its fruits seriously, he achieved the goals that he set for himself. When Trotsky and Zinoviev flew up to the podium so that, finding themselves in their native rally element, they could win back all the lost points at once, the audience prepared by Stalin silenced them with Bolshevik directness. In short, in the struggle for political office, Aristippus is certainly, maybe it says, like, the best or the greatest, but it cut off there. And Aristippus is a nickname for FLVE. More generally speaking, the following kind of pattern can be deduced. With an indefinitely narrowed elected system of succession of power, the place of the first will is certainly inherited by the third will, but not just the third will, but the nominal one with logic at the top. There, thus, just as the seizure of power by Lenin in 1917 was inevitable, inevitable so was the inheritance of his post by Stalin. 
So let me let me think about that. Okay. Interesting. Uh, the accession to the throne of the third will creates a new environment around the new leader, the new ruler, convenient for a given psychotype, different from the one that previously surrounded the king. Firstly, the holders of high-ranking wills, who are tolerated by the first will on the periphery, are sent into political oblivion, because the Philistine not only does not like them, but is also afraid. Secondly, the third will, rightly judged by itself, is suspicious of the same people, is unstable in its attitude towards them and tries, for the sake of safety, to dilute the environment with the owners of the fourth will. Only in the circle of serfs does the third will feel truly comfortable, and under its sovereign hand, the fourth will gradually flows from the second echelon of power to the first. Similar transformations took place in Stalin's circle with his accession to the Russian throne. Under him, the high-ranking will was subjected to total extermination, and here Stalin managed to fulfill the long-standing dream of all tyrants to organize not an, eth an ethnic, not a social, but the first all-encompassing psychotypical genocide. Fortunately, the Communist Party and the NKVD were up to the task of the unique were up to the task for this unique task. As for Stalin's immediate entourage, the third wheel remained in the retinue but lost the majority. Uh, Beria, Khrushchev, Kaganovich, Mikoyan. And the fourth will unexpectedly established itself in key positions. Molotov, Kalinin, uh, Voroshilov, uh, Malenkov, Bolganin. Therefore, when Stalin's turn to take up the harp and heavenly choir, the reins of government that had fallen from his hands uh, fell unexpectedly, but naturally, into the sluggish hands of Malenkov. Uh, Malenkov. Although, if you think about it, it was not a chance, but a pattern that dictated this kind of continuity. The death of a Philistine ruler who sincerely sympathized with the fourth will as far as possible for him almost automatically shifts the unbearable burden of power onto the shoulders of the serf. If you believe Khrushchev, Stalin in recent years liked to lament in the spirit that they are poor, poor members of the Politburo because after his death they will certainly disappear. And I must admit I was not far from the truth. True, this prophecy did not cost him much because he himself spent years on selection work in the Politburo, consistently selecting for him individuals with the worst physical, volitional, and mental characteristics. The crowning achievement of Stalin's activity in this way can be considered the moment when he, already dying, called the most helpless of his supporters, Malenkov, and defiantly shook his hand with this almost mafia gesture confirming his choice of, of successor. Everyone knew about Malenkov's weak character in Stalin's circle. Later, Khrushchev and Molotov spoke openly about this, and when people who themselves are not distinguished by fortitude talk about someone's weak character, then there cannot be two opinions. We are talking about the fourth will. Therefore, it is not surprising that in the specific conditions of the communist, in, of the communist indefinitely narrow election system, Two of Malenkov's colleagues began to lay claim to the already seemingly occupied throne, Khrushchev and Beria. Uh, yeah, Beria. Again, as after Lenin's death, three entered the struggle for leadership, but the disposition of the battle looked different. Okay. Fortunately, I can't read that, but I guess uh, there was maybe an EFBL in here and an EVFL. Uh, leaving the harmless Malenkov for a snack, um, immediately after the death of Stalin, Khrushchev and Beria fought to the death. So I guess uh, Khrushchev and Beria didn't think much of Malenkov. Of course, as is the custom of the, thir of the Third Wills, they grappled indirectly, uh, slyly, and their fight, as Churchill aptly put it, was reminiscent of bulldogs fighting under the carpet. The result is known. Beria lost and was shot. An analysis of why history decided the fate of its rivals this way, and not otherwise, could be uh, the subject of a separate essay. It is, only, uh, it is only obvious that the outcome was influenced by many factors. Beria's chief executioner functions, his forced departure to Berlin to suppress the uprising, etc. But there is also a purely psycho psychotypical aspect that pre predetermined Khrushchev's victory. Um, so I guess one of them, maybe Beria, was a uh, 
oh boy, I'm actually, I'm actually not really sure. Okay, no, so Barry, I think, was supposed to be an FEVL, and Khrushchev was an EFVL. Uh, in themselves, Pushkin and Dumas are very similar types, so EFVL and FEVL. The difference between them is limited to the crosshairs from the first function to the second. And, for example, in everyday life, the struggle between them can drag on for years without any result. But politics is not everyday life. And besides, in this case, the outcome of the battle was influenced by the preference given to one type or another by other members of the Politburo. Therefore, despite the similarity of types, Khrushchev's victory was quite natural. Dumas, the type to which Beria belonged, was generally poorly suited to serious political struggle. Dumas is lazy by nature and quickly relaxes without supervision, which is what happened with Beria. Having outlived the ruler who kept him in fear, Beria decided that the job was done, and he started digging under Khrushchev lazily, carelessly, and devoted most of his energy to what his soul was more in, running after women, first physics, and performing opera arias, second emotion. The Pushkin type, the type to which Khrushchev belonged, looks and acts differently in politics. Being no more thoughtful and no more cunning than Dumas, Pushkin has the advantage that he has a second physics degree. Therefore, he is energetic, efficient, hardworking, and the circumstances decisive in this scenario uh, for the struggle for power. He arouses the sympathy of his colleagues and rewards bulldog grip. Having quickly propagandized his cowardly colleagues in the Politburo, Khrushchev, with his characteristic energy, in a few days formalized the technical side of the conspiracy and put Beria against the wall. The further removal of Malenkov uh, was already a matter of technique. Having found fault with the usual lie for communist leaders in one of Malenkov's speeches, Khrushchev openly, simply, without any pretense, pulled the reins of power from his sluggish hands, and Malenkov, with his fourth will, had neither the, the desire nor the strength for a serious struggle for power. Thus, Khrushchev needed only a year after Stalin's death to deal with his rivals and take the Russian throne. Okay. And, yeah, I'm just kind of curious what Malenkov's type was here. I know his fourth will. Um, I believe... Uh, F... L E V. Okay, F L E V is what how he types Malenkov. Okay. Uh, ten years will pass, and Beria will still get Khrushchev out of the grave on a tangent, because Khrushchev in turn will be overthrown from the th will be overthrown from the throne by Beria's psychological identical Brezhnev, who is also an F E V L, nicknamed Dumas. However, why and how this happened needs special mention. Perhaps against the backdrop of Dumas, Pushkin, who is busy with politics, looks preferable, but he cannot be classified as a successful politician. Hysteria and inability to behave, a combination of first emotion and third will, stupid vanity, a combination of second physics and fourth logic, day by day multiply the ranks of opponents of Pushkin, the ruler, until the cup overflows and his, and his are not sent into political oblivion. Okay, I think he's he's just saying his cup overflows and he's sent into political oblivion. Another question is, who will inherit the Pushkin throne? I don't know how it is in other countries, but in Russia, Pushkin is certainly replaced by Dumas. At least two precedents in Russian history allow us to talk about the system in replacing Pushkin with Dumas in Russia. The election of Catherine I and Anna uh, Ion, Ionovna after the death of the absurdly troublesome Peter the Great and the successful conspiracy against Khrushchev led by Brezhnev. The mechanism of this pattern is quite transparent. Uh, tired of the chronically stupid bustle of Pushkin, society craves nothing more than to relax, rest, and calls for Dumas to the throne. Dumas is a holiday man, lazy, cunning, cruel, thieving, cheerful, charming, interspersing executions with feasts, award ceremonies, and fireworks. Despite the fact that Dumas is by nature an executioner and a traitor, after Pushkin, who exhausted the people, he suits almost everyone. He steals and lets others steal, and in general is too lazy, stupid, and indecisive to consistently and effectively rape society. <laughs> 
dude. And that's like that's just a that's just a, a little sliver, a little glimpse into how he he makes his type description sections, which I skipped over. And Pushkin and Dumas get like very short thrift. Um, but again, I like to imagine that you know he's describing these kind of Russian political gangsters, you know, and so it's like if you imagine the types all as like brutal gangsters then that's like maybe a good a good description for how you know vlfes and flves and efvls and uh, fevls respectively would act as like you know russian you know russian autocrats right um so we can get something from it but i just love his the way he he writes um it's it's pretty funny to me uh, predicting the fate of the Dumas on the throne is a hopeless matter. In ancient Rome, all the Dumas emperors died a violent death. The Russian Dumas rulers died in their beds. But in the event of a nonviolent end to his political career, Dumas, as is the custom of the third will, makes his heir the owner of the fourth will, which in our case, with some hitch on Andropov, is what happened. Chernenko, or as he called him, um... or as he called him, the flexible Kostya, ascended the throne called... Okay, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm butchering this. Well, really, it's already butchered, but I'm re-butchering it. Um, so, Andropov is what happened. Chernenko, um, as he called him, ascended the throne called in the highest echelons of power, the flexible Kostya, which, no idea what that means. We're almost done here. Uh, in theory, Chernenko, as the owner of the fourth will, should have shared the fate of Malenkov, i.e. will soon part with the reins of power torn from his hands by some efficient Pushkin. But life decreed otherwise, relegating mental typology to the background when solving personnel issues. Firstly, Chernenko was in a hurry to die, without waiting for the overthrow. Secondly, Brezhnev's long-term uh, somnambulism well, had a strong personality on Dropov, who was a VLEF Socrates, uh, to gain a foothold in the Politburo. He not only managed to sit on the throne for a year, but most importantly, introduced people close to his own psychotype into the highest e echelons of power. One of them, Gorbachev, was destined to take the Russian throne, empty after Chernenko's death. Without setting myself the task of exploring the Gorbachev phenomenon in its entire psychological scope, I will only note what, from a typological point of view, lies on the surface. Gorbachev is Lenin, Okay, so he's a VLFE. Uh, with all the consequences arising from this order of functions, Gorbachev is a dictator, a talker, and rather a tactician than a strategist in thinking, a communist, and a non resistance rolled into one, so third physics. Um, so, in other words, he's, you know, he's uh, micromanaging and concerned about physical needs, so he's a communist, and he's um, a pacifist, um, so he's third physics. It would seem that the reappearance of Lenin on the Russian throne programmed the reproduction of the entire entire cycle of Soviet history again, and that's how it went. Gorbachev, according to the Leninist tradition, threw out from his circle people with character, holders of high-ranking wills, Yeltsin, Ligachev, uh, Shevard, Shevardnadze, and formed the retinue of crafty, weak-willed, slow-witted people which was demonstrated with a deafening clarity by the failed August 1991 putsch. The difference between Lenin and Gorbachev in the event of a successful push, putsch could only be that Gorbachev was inherited by the same third will, but not by Stalin, Aristippus, who was not nearby, but a uh, Yaniev, another a Dumas, F-E-V-L. However, the evil infinity of Russian history was interrupted even before the coup by two major mistakes of Gorbachev. Permission for Glasnost and elections. They gave birth to the, de to the democratic movement. Yeltsin, and most importantly, destroyed the very system of power in which the fate of the main personnel issues was decided by a small conclave selected by the prin princeps himself. <sighs> Summing up the analysis of the principles of inheritance of power under a totalitarian, indefinite, narrow election system, we can state the presence of the following patterns. The founder of such a will is the first will. Uh, it is inherited by the third will, and in the presence of competitors, the one whose logic is higher than in the third will is the one who wins. 
The third will is inherited by someone with the fourth will, who is soon deprived of power by the owner of the third will, most likely Pushkin. Uh, if Pushkin comes to power, then Dumas will inherit him. After the, the Dumas, the fourth will comes to power but soon loses it, what will be the order of functions of a person who, in the latter case, has snatched the fourth will from the hands as a matter of fortune telling, but not knowledge, although we can say with confidence that it will be either the third or the first will. And who the heck knows if there was more after this, but that is the end of the syntax of love. Um, so yeah, I mean, I this section is, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know what to make of it. Um, I mean, we're totally missing the second volition here. And I know for a fact that there are second volition types who come to power. Um, but he does say the principle of inheritance of power under a totalitarian um, narrow election system. So he's he's trying to extrapolate from the Russian example. I mean, it's kind of a small sample size, but he's saying in these kind of totalitarian systems where there's some election possible it's not like a you know a, a primogeniture it's not like inherited an inherited monarchy it's a somewhat elected like an oligarchic system he's noticing this power or this uh, excuse me this um pattern of power uh and yeah maybe i mean maybe two v's are just like screw this like you know this is not the system for me um but yeah, that's interesting. So that's it for the syntax of love. Uh, if anyone actually made through made it this far and listened to the entire thing, I want to congratulate you for being an utter fool <laughs> for listening to me go on. Um, and but you know, man, I, I appreciate the the. I, no, I, I'm I'm joking, but I do appreciate it. Um, and I'm kind of losing my uh, my will to go on here. But yeah, I just want to say if anyone actually listened to this, then I do highly appreciate it. And please comment and reach out to me because I'd love to talk about this stuff with people who are uh, truly interested in it. And uh, I'd also like to say um, definitely go check out Rob's uh, Attitudinal Psyche website. Um, I think it really systematizes this, this theory um, and he kind of... He really brings it. Um, he really brings it together, and he updates it for a modern audience. And yeah, it's a little more sterilized, a little more kind of feel-good, egalitarian stuff. But you know, I think it's uh, superior um, overall to this. But this is, you know, still still the guy who created the theory. Um, so it's worth reading. And I think yeah, there's probably there's a lot in here that going through this for the second time, I will remember, and I took note of, um, <clears throat> just throughout this book, little nuggets, um, and things that I, that I have been noticing in, in my typings of people. So it's definitely worth, if you're going to be, if you're just interested in attitudinal psyche, um, I think it's still worth understanding the syntax of love and doing your best to get through it. Um, because it'll, it'll give you a different perspective on psychosophy, the original one. Um, okay, so I'm totally losing, I'm just babbling here because I'm like kind of losing my will to go on. But in any case, that's it.